Hi everyone, welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. As a vice president of the Harvard Republican Club, I have encountered dozens of different definitions of what it means to be Republican or conservative. As many of you are aware, this year Mickey Edwards published his book, Reclaiming Conservatism. The following passage resonated with my own experiences as a self-described conservative. Why does it matter if American conservatism returns to its principles? It matters because liberals too often believe in enhancing the power of the state and are too willing to sacrifice the rights of the individuals to the collective and because today's conservatives have adopted the same view. Both seem inclined to envision a perfect society and then to impose it on the rest of us. In the debates to come, America needs one group of men and women whose commitment is to a government that adheres to the Constitution, one that respects the restraints that safeguard the civil, human, constitutional rights of the American people. Mickey Edwards is no stranger to Harvard. For 11 years, he taught here at the Kennedy School as the John Adams Lecturer in Legislative Practice. However, his academic career began quite far away from Cambridge at the University of Oklahoma, where he earned a BA in journalism and eventually studied law. From 1958 to 1963, Edwards served as a newspaper reporter and editor. In 1973, his career in Washington, D.C. began as he worked as a legislative aide for the Republican Steering Committee. In 1976, Edwards was elected as a representative to the U.S. Congress for Oklahoma's 5th District. He served as a member of the Appropriations and Budget Committees and was the ranking member in the House Subcommittee on Foreign Operations. He was also a member of the House Republican leadership, serving in the party's fourth ranking leadership position as chairman of the House Republican Policy Committee. As a founding trustee of the Heritage Foundation and a national chairman of the American Conservative Union, Edwards' career has been marked by a dedication to conservative politics and values. He has served as co-chairman of Citizens for Independent Courts, a national organization dedicated to preserving judicial independence, and co-chairman of Citizens for the Constitution, a national organization concerned with limiting the use of constitutional amendments as a substitute for the normal legislative process. In addition, Edwards served as chairman of the Conservative Political Action Conference for five years, has served on the board of directors of the Constitution Project, and was the director of the Congressional Policy Task Forces, which advised Ronald Reagan's 1980 presidential campaign. Also joining Mickey Edwards tonight is David King and Congressman Jim Leach. David King joined the Kennedy School faculty in 1992 after receiving his PhD from the University of Michigan. He is currently a lecturer in public policy and teaches about US Congress, political parties, and election reform. He also teaches the widely popular class, The Politics of Congress, at the college. He has authored, co-authored, and co-edited three books on Congress and public confidence in government. King currently chairs Harvard's program for newly elected members of Congress and has worked extensively on election reform, most recently with the Boston Department for Voter, Voter Mobilization. Jim Leach is the current director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Leach was elected to the US Congress in 1976 and served 15 terms as an Iowa representative. While in Congress, he chaired two national organizations dedicated to moderate Republican causes, the Ripon Society and the Republican Mainstream Committee. He also chaired the Banking and Financial Services Committee, the Subcommittee on Asian and Pacific Affairs, and the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Prior to his appointment as the director of the IOP, Leach taught at the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton University, where he was a John L. Weinberg Visiting Pu Professor of Public and International Affairs. Please help me in joining to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, Jim Leach, David King, and Mickey Edwards. Well, it's uh, my honor to begin this discussion, and I'm particularly honored because I'm with an old friend, Mickey Edwards. Mickey and I came into Congress together, and Mickey is one of the most uh, decent people I've ever served with. Uh, David is a colleague here teaching, and I think, uh, Everybody's envious of David because he teaches the most popular course uh, and most thought-provoking course on Congress, I think, in the country. And so it's great to be with you, David. Uh, I am holding in my hand uh, uh, Mickey's book, and this is what is inspiring this particular occasion, and I hope all of you have a chance to read it, uh, Reclaiming Conservatism. Uh, and I want to uh, first just begin by asking uh, Mickey, uh, 
as you look at the American conservative movement as it's latched on uh, to this administration, uh, what is it that you're seeing that you think is inconsistent with uh, traditional, at least traditional in the sense of kind of the Goldwater, Robert Taft tradition? Well, you know, uh, first let, let me say it's, it, it is really a great thrill to be back here. Mm. You know, as Jim said, I taught here uh, for 11 years. I've known Jim now since we were elected at the same time 30 years ago. That's scary, 30 years ago. Uh, and David and I were teaching together here 15 years ago. So uh, it, it, I guess what it really means is I'm getting old, but uh, <laughs> it, it is exciting to be back here again. Uh, what, what I'm talking about there, first of all, one of the things I talk about in the book, which is, is not directly related, is that the number of things that have changed in American conservatism uh, over the last 40 and more years, that today conservatives actually, or the people, the people who call themselves conservatives, people like Rush Limbaugh and Ann Coulter and Tom DeLay, people who wouldn't know a conservative if it bit them on the ankles, you know, they, um, the, ha, have taken positions and advocated ideas that in the past we conservatives would have been marching in the streets to protest. And in, in fact, if, if Lyndon Johnson did the things that, that George Bush did, you know, we would have been out protesting. And one of the things that's happened uh, is that con we, we used to talk in the conservative movement because we, we were motivated by the Constitution. We were Madisonians. We believed uh, in, in limited government, but uh, as Ronald Reagan put it in that famous speech, remember when he said, uh, government's not the, uh, not the solution, government's the problem? Well, that's, that's not the Ronald Reagan I knew. Uh, so I went back and I looked up the actual quote, which I have in the book, and he said, government's not the, uh, not the solution, government's the problem in the current circumstance, which was the Carter administration. Uh, and and then, <laughs> then he went on at some length to say we are not anti-government. We're for government that creates opportunity and prosperity and so forth. So, you know, what's happened is in, in recent years, conservatives have forgotten what conservatism was all about. They brought in new kinds of, of that, whether it's the religious right, the neocons, had nothing to do with, with conservative ideas. But along the way, Jim, this is the answer, took a long time to get to the answer to your question, but here's what happened. Under your friend, your good friend, and my good friend, Newt Gingrich, uh, the dynamic among Republicans in the Congress changed to where instead of acting as responsible legislators, it was your job to maintain continual persistent warfare against the other party. So if you're a Republican, your, your job was to defeat the other party no matter what. So then you have a president come into office who happens to be a Republican, uh, who is, is very cavalier about the Constitution, declares that he doesn't have to obey laws even that, that he has signed, and now, rather than the Congress standing up to him, the conservative Congress for six years, conservative Republican Congress, instead of serving as a check on the executive branch, which is the oath of office we took, they don't see him as the head of another branch. They see him as their team captain, their party leader. Uh, and they rally around him. And that's, so what you have seen is Republicans in Congress who have stopped doing the job of being members of Congress, a president who uh, has stopped uh, uh, adhering to the Constitution, uh, and you know that that is it's all different. It's so different from when when you and I were there, and, and Ronald Reagan was the president, and we all thought he was great. And, and if uh, when we disagreed with him, we voted against him. You know, we didn't take an oath of office of loyalty to the president. You know, we, we took an oath of loyalty to the country. Well, I want to turn to David for a second. Uh, philosophically, there there are two streams of conservative thought in in. Uh, Western history, and one uh, springs from John Locke, and, and John Locke, who was really the godfather philosophically of Thomas Jefferson, was all about individual rights. Locke defined it as life, liberty, and property. Jefferson got a little more poetic, saying life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. By the way, a, a phrase borrowed from a Swiss natural rights philosopher named, uh, well, I'll think of it in a minute, doesn't matter. Uh, but. Uh, Burke argued, Edmund Burke, that in addition to individual rights, or maybe more fundamental, societies move slowly, and that there is a great reverence to, to, to social systems as they exist. And so conservatism is about preservation of values of, of uh, 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 
society. And in a way, if you take today's moment, one has the sense that uh, there's a conservatism of values and then there's a conservatism of individual rights. I've always identified Mickey as the individual rights conservative. But there's another element that's kind of social values. And then one of the questions become, uh, do you coerce with other people's values on yourself? How do you see this, David, in, as working out in the Republican Party today? Well, I think those two strands are absolutely right. Edmund Burke said that uh, I owe you, the electors of Bristol, my best judgment. And you'll judge me based on how I envision the future. And so that's around grand ideas, around philosophy, perhaps around religious values. And uh, Locke believed that government was not there to, to promote any vision of the truth or of a good society, but that would emerge through the rational actions of individuals unfettered by government. That crucial phrase in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? Meaning we have access to truth not through government, that all men are created equal, which was not all people created equal, but the government is not better than us that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, not endowed by or through government. Inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. The first version said property. They amended it, changed it in committee to say pursuit of happiness, which is much more poetic. But the Lockean version is um, much more of a libertarian version and ought to be thought of that uh, in today's terms. The Burkean version, which of course Edmund Burke didn't hold to by the end of his life, but is, uh, is always thought of as Burkean, uh, is that government can be a vehicle for high-minded people to help shape a society. Uh, in the phrase of uh, George Will's first book, Statecraft as Soulcraft. And those are the two tensions that we've seen in the Republican Party during your time, uh, your era, in the growth and change of this party. The social conservatives took over from the more libertarians uh, bent of the party, and that's a battle that is now engaged and presumably has fractured the party and will cost them the presidency. But, but uh, let me also say, Jim, that starting with the Goldwater years, uh, the idea of conservatives changed. Winston Churchill is often looked at as a great conservative, and, and, and he was, but not an American conservative. You know, and Winston Churchill wrote you know, that the values to be preserved were the church and the king. And uh, American conservatism was based on conserving the Constitution, the Constitution which does uh, protect individual freedoms as well uh, as create a framework for which through which government can operate. You know, the, um, our Constitution has both empowerment for government to act and constraints on what it can do, uh, mostly with its separated powers. And, um, I, I don't think there's the, for a while there was no tension. For a while, uh, we in the conservative movement had brought them together where we were conserving the values of the Constitution uh, that the, you know, you're just watching John Adams, you know, that the founders uh, fought for. Well, another way of looking at American history is that we were the first country that was really founded under the precept of the rights of man. Uh, and then we had a, uh, that was at the revolution. Uh, then we had over a century of fighting on definitions, whether the word man applied to people that weren't simply male and weren't simply pale. Uh, and then, particularly in the 20th century, there was a, this struggle on uh, uh, whether if rights are valid, doesn't everyone have an equal crack at the American dream, and so the issue of opportunity. And it seems to me the first two battles have largely been won. Uh, the second is continual. I mean, if you're going to have opportunity, what is the role of a state? And for example, the, uh, what is the role in education? Uh, what is the role in uh, making sure that, that, that people that aren't, uh, uh, that have disadvantages are, are helped along? Uh, and then does government get more corrosively involved? And, and where do you draw these lines? And in the 30s, I think the, the case for Franklin Delano Roosevelt might have been fairly powerful. By the 80s, the case for Ronald Reagan was uh, awfully compelling. And so you have these, these two streams. Uh, and now you seem to have a sense that, that uh, uh, 
uh, maybe people are trying to do both at a time period where one or the other might be a preferable model. Do you, do you have any sense for that? You know, it's not entirely, um, it, conservatives today seem to be focused entirely on, uh, on outcome. And it's not a matter of whether or not the United States as a, as a government uh, decides to do A or B. It's a matter of how we decide it. The thing that makes our system work and that makes it the kind of a democracy that it is, which is a mediated uh, democracy, uh, is that the people decide. The difference, when we, tr when we created this system 200 and some years ago, uh, the founders created the system. What, here was the fundamental change that they made. Pre-United States, the form of government that was prevalent was rulers and their subjects. Rulers and their subjects. And our founders said, we're not going to be subjects. We're going to be citizens. And the fundamental difference is that rulers tell their subjects what to do, but citizens tell their government what to do. Uh, and they do that. Um, what, one of the things that drove me nuts is that uh, Dana Perino at the, on the White House staff, uh, responding to criticisms by me, among others, you know, that the, uh, uh, the administration was not paying any heed to the, to the people, uh, on the war or, or anything else, uh, she said, well, we do listen to the people. The people get a chance to speak every four years. And the answer is, well, no. First of all, they get a chance to vote every two years for the branch of government that under the Constitution has the primary authority on war, on treatment of prisoners, on deciding what's a violation of international law, on tax, prior, tax rates and spending priorities, you know, our branch of government. And that the people don't speak every four years, they speak every day through their elected representatives in the House and Senate. Uh, and the, so, you know, in, in my mind, it's not about what government can do. You know, like, take electronic surveillance. Uh, the Congress felt, just as the administration did, that with the threat we face, it was important to be able to uh, listen in on phone conversations. And the Congress, by the way, this is a big shock to the administration, Members of Congress aren't eager for, eager for people in this country to get killed either. You know, so they also said, yes, we, we, it's okay to listen in, but you've got to get a court warrant. Now, that's the process. The people spoke through their representatives and said, here is the law. Here is the way in which you can do what government needs to do. Uh, and the problem there was uh, not the surveillance, but the president saying, you know, I don't need to get a court warrant. I'm the president. Uh, and, and directly violated the law. So it's, it's process. The process is very important. Well, Mickey, you in your book uh, use the word imperial a lot. And uh, you, you read the book. <laughs> yeah. The uh, uh, point I'm making is that, that this issue of, of an imperial presidency, uh, uh, we have the issue abroad, which I think is worthy of discussion. Uh, and we also have it to some degree at home. Uh, I'd, I'd like you to, to kind of elaborate what you mean by an imperial presidency and how does that fit into the American constitutional tradition uh, and not only the separation between Congress and the executive, but uh, as you indicate with wiretapping, Congress, the executive, and the, and the third branch of government at the national level, the courts. Well, first of all, let me say I am very hesitant to do this with a... Uh, a, a senior veteran member of Congress here and a renowned political <laughs> science professor here, you know, and people in the audience who know a lot more than I do. But let, let me start with this. Uh, when I talk about the imperial presidency, one of, the, one of the greatest men ever to teach in this building, Richard Neustadt, was a strong believer uh, in, in the idea of a strong president. He advocated a strong president. I think with the threats we face, we need a strong president. But there is a difference between a strong president and the office of, a strong office of the presidency. A strong president, as Neustadt defined it, was somebody who was inspiring, who could unite, who had a vision, not somebody who was made, quote, the decider. And uh, what we have run into the, the specific examples, okay, you know, number one was the wiretapping, uh, where the, the Congress had passed legislation, signed into law, that said that you have to have a court warrant from a special court. The president said, I don't need to do that. The Congress passed a prohibition on uh, torture. 
Uh, the president said, I'll decide whether I have to obey that. In fact, as Charlie Savage of the Boston Globe reported, the president had issued 1,100 such signing statements, more than every president in the history of the United States combined, none of whom had ever used it in the same way. You know, they used it before to say, this is a great bill, this is a terrible bill, but, but I have to sign it. Now, he was saying, uh, I do not have to uh, obey the laws I've just signed. Well, you know what? Article 1, Section 7 of the Constitution says, you presented a bill passed by Congress, you can only do one of two things. You sign it, then it's law, it's binding on all of us, binding on all of you, it's binding on the president. Or you can veto it and give the Congress a chance to override it. Um, so he did that over and over. Uh, a study by the GAO found that uh, as he claimed unitary executive to a, a different kind of description of unitary executive, now it was the idea that the Congress could not tell any federal agency, bureau, or department what to do because they only worked for him. And, and uh, so somebody, I was testifying before the House Judiciary Committee about it, uh, and one of, the, one of our members uh, said, well, is there any indication at all that they really do disobey the law? And the GAO did a study and found one-third of the cases in the year 2006 appropriation bill where they'd been given mandates to the agencies, they just ignored them. And uh, so, it, you know, it's on and on. There, there, there's... Uh, can I just use one, one more quick example? It's just shocking to me. There is the theory of, the, of uh, executive privilege. Executive privilege is an absolutely proper theory. It says the president is protected in his right to get candid, unvarnished advice. <clears throat> so when the Congress, acting within its rights, decided to do an investigation of the firing of federal prosecutors, which they had a right to do, and the president probably had a right to fire it. You know, they worked for him. Uh, the Judiciary Committee, our friends, politely, I think politely, invited Harriet Myers and Josh Bolton from the White House to come testify. They declined. That was their right. You know, it's like getting invited to a party. You don't have to go. Uh, but then they issued a subpoena. Well, a subpoena is not like a party invitation. Uh, and they said, well, we still don't have to go. Why? Because, you know, of executive privilege. We're immune from being questioned by the Congress of the United States because of executive privilege. But both of them said, Myers and Bolton both said, and the White House said, the president was not involved in those conversations. So now they're claiming executive privilege, immunity from being questioned, when one member of the White House staff speaks to another member of the White House staff. So there's just a few of the examples when I, when I talk about the imperial presidency, you know. Even Richard Nixon with the fancy uh, hats and, and you know, operatic costumes he put his guards in, you know, didn't come close to what this president has done. But notice that this happened under um, Republican watch. Under United Government, uh, Article One, Section 6 of the Constitution says that the executive branch and legislative branch have to be separate. If you're serving in the legislative branch, you cannot also serve in the executive branch. But what we've created or what we've allowed to be created is essentially a prime minister, an imperial prime minister, in which the heads of the Republican Party have over the last few years allowed the Republican Party to run both branches of government. With the signing statements, for example, yes, more signing statements than all presidents in the past added together and of a different type because they're directive as opposed to simply uh, based on opinion. But they didn't come out of just thin air. Many of these signing statements were secretly negotiated with the leadership on the Hill, committee chairs, the leadership directly, so your colleagues in the House and the Senate allowed this weed of power to grow. David, I, what, do you, what do you think the president means when he says, uh, I'm the decider? Well, I think the president, when he's talked about himself as the decider, is placing his powers clearly in Article Two, saying within my rights as an Article Two, as the uh, chief executive, uh, of the executive branch or as the uh, commander-in-chief, I'm allowed a certain latitude. And no statute that the, that the uh, Congress can come up with can diminish my powers as the chief executive. So he's ultimately the decider. But this boundary line between the constitutional powers of the chief executive and the, uh, and the powers under Article One, Section 8 is very fuzzy. And so control over the, uh, over the judiciary is crucial over the coming years. One of my favorite comments on television in recent months was a, a comment by an historian named John Norton Smith at, at the Nixon Library. And uh, 
a call-in show on C-SPAN was to the effect, why do you think Nixon used the tapes? And uh, Professor uh, Smith said, well, we know one of the reasons. Uh, on one of the tapes, Nixon is saying, now we'll be able to show the world that I, and not Henry Kissinger, am making these decisions. <laughs> so he was using tapes to prove he was the decider. And I'm not so sure. Uh, what, would you think there's a possibility the president is saying it's I and not the vice president who is making these decisions? <laughs> Perhaps. There's a classic overreach going on, and, uh, and we hope that it will move the pendulum, the pendulum will move back. But if the Democrats uh, win the White House, they may fall into the same uh, pit with the United Government that the Republicans have. And representative government is far more important than Democrats or Republicans. And uh, uh, that concerns me a great deal. Yeah, my, my book is very critical of Republicans because uh, during the six years when you had the coming together of the Bush presidency with the Republican Congress that empowered him, uh, it created this situation that's worse than any I've known. But, you know, I, I heard Nancy, Nancy Pelosi is a good friend of mine, and, and we used to work together on uh, human rights issues, uh, Chinese human rights issues and others. Uh, and, and I've admired the way she stood up to the White House, but she said something the other day on the radio uh, where she said that her job as Speaker was to ensure that there is a Democratic majority in, in the House. And, and I thought to myself, no, that's Denny Hoyer's job. He's the majority leader, or it's Rahm Emanuel's job. But it's not her job. Her job is to uh, stand up for the legislative branch of government. Uh, that's the job of the Speaker. And, and it's very important because uh, Denny Hastert, when he was uh, uh, the Republican Speaker of the House, and Bill Frist, when he was the Republican Majority Leader of the Senate, basically believed it was their job to enact the President's agenda. And they said that. Uh, and I hope that if there is a Democratic President and Democrats keep control of Congress, uh, that Democrats won't fall into that same trap and say, okay, now it's our job to carry out either Obama's or Clinton's agenda. I want to ask one more broad kind of philosophical question, then we're going to throw it open to, to the audience. Uh, coming back to this term, pursuit of happiness, which derives from a man named Berla McKay now, but it, it uh, doesn't escape me as it did earlier. There's a difference between pursuit of happiness and pursuit of re-election. And one has a sense in American politics today that uh, people in public life are pursuing re-election Whereas pursuit of happiness has something to do with the public. That is, what's best for the public, the greatest good of the greatest number kind of conceptualizations in the abstract. And I'm wondering whether you think uh, both the executive and legislative branches uh, have lost a little bit of sight of the common good kinds of arguments that are 19th century, which are, were very much at the time of the founders. Uh, and then, in thinking in those terms, whether either of you have a view on, on uh, uh, the new Republican Party that's being rebuilt this year under uh, John McCain, where, where he fits into this spectrum of, of uh, American political thinking. Is he on the social conservative side, which you might say is Burkean? Or is he on the individual right side that you might say is Lockean? But let me, well, David, you go. Um. I'm actually quite optimistic about this pursuit of re-election. I think uh, that we're at an, a very important point in American history. There's a grand mobilization happening. Uh, not only a new generation of voters, but lots of first-time voters are brought into this process in a way that we haven't seen in the past. Now, and certainly haven't seen for generations. Uh, if you look at the turnout in the primaries, it's between 25 and 30 percent increase in the primaries uh, among the Democrats in turnout. It's dramatic. We're going to have among the highest turnouts as a percentage of eligible voters in the fall that uh, we've ever witnessed. It, it'll probably go back 75 to 100 years since we've seen this kind of a turnout. That is going to make it um, more likely that representatives will actually represent the kinds of voters that show up in the, in the general election. Our classic problem is you have a narrow slice of the electorate in the, in the primary, and then the general election 
uh, is sort of stuck with these two extremes uh, of the left and the right. And it's exacerbated by things such as redistricting, where you pack the districts with like-minded ideologues. Um, we're seeing a lot more heterogeneity in these electorates now, and I think that will lead towards a, a more common or more broad view. I'll leave it up to, uh, to Mickey to talk about someone else from Arizona. He talks a lot about, uh, about Goldwater, and very interestingly in the book. But I wonder where John McCain is. Well, let, let, two things I would say in that. Uh, uh, I would just add to what David said. Part of it, is, you know, you have the, uh, the fact of, of the districts where, where yeah, I, you know, I don't want to be Jimmy Carter here blaming the public for malaise, but, you know, part of the problem, part of the reason we're in this mess we're in is because voters can't be bothered to go out and vote in the primaries. Uh, and so the primaries are dominated by people on the extreme wings, you know, while everybody else then just complains about the extremes uh, dominating. I think that's part of it. But, but part of it also, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, is the focus on party. James Madison, who I think is, is maybe the greatest American ever, you know, James Madison really warned against the danger of faction and the danger of political parties. And I know that some political scientists, not you, but some political scientists want strong political parties because it makes it easy to, to predict what's going to happen. But strong political parties, allegiance to your party above all, has been a real problem. Now, let, I, I see in this coming election, pick up on another of your points, I see a hopeful sign. Uh, you know, sometimes if you go too far, you go too far, Eventually, people say, that's enough. Now, Barack Obama's popularity is largely because of him, uh, his rhetoric, his ideas, his, uh, his discussion of change. It's also partly because uh, of George Bush. Uh, because, you know, right now, after, after seven and a half years of this administration, people desperately want change. And the guy who's, who is able the most efficiently or effectively to say, I'm the one who's going to make something different happen, you know, uh, gets a, a, a wave going here. I will say a couple of things in, in, about John McCain, partly the answer to your question. I've seen John McCain get attacked uh, as not a conservative. Uh, and a couple of different uh, attacks, attack lines, one of them was that he voted to allow drilling uh, uh, in the Alaskan, uh, I mean, to prevent drilling in the Alaskan Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we well, you know, Barry Goldwater, one of his books, has a whole chapter on preserving the environment. Russell Kirk, the conservative uh, uh, scholar, talked all the time about the, the obligation of conservatives to protect the environment uh, as their tradition. The other thing McCain gets attacked for is for voting against George Bush's tax cuts. But George Bush was proposing major tax cuts that would reduce revenues at a time we were going into a multi-billion dollar war. And I'll tell you, Barry Goldwater would have voted against them. Ronald Reagan would have voted against them. You know, and John McCain was the conservative and, and George Bush was the liberal. You know, so uh, uh, the, the final point I make here is that one, one other reason for maybe supporting McCain, not trying to talk you into doing it, anybody out there. Uh, but he has been so vigorously and violently opposed by the Rush Limbaugh's and the Ann Coulter's and the, and the Hannity's and, and uh, the um, Tom DeLay's, you know, that maybe, maybe if he wins, it'll put them back in their box. It's very interesting. Does anyone have any questions they want to raise? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm curious if you have any, any questions. McCain was asked uh, several questions, and also uh, many people have challenged his conservatism in terms of historical values. Uh, nobody's really talked about, for example, the moral issues. Okay, I know there is the constitutional right, but uh, how important is the history of uh, the Puritans, for example, here, right here in New England? in terms of what it valued people's lives. I mean, if you look at conservative history, don't you see the significance of life? And, and where does uh, McCain stand on that? Because somebody like, uh, you know, many of the conservatives on the right, for example, uh, will, will challenge the view that actually the country is driven in the last, uh, the last 50 years away from valuing life. And uh, pro-life movements have, have emerged. James Dobson will not support him. Many others will not. So, so do you feel that this is important to American voters who came out last, in the last election who 
turn out for George Bush because they felt the evangelical voice were not being heard. I think that equation uh, should not be brought from the carpet of constitutionalism because without that, you've lost the history, what's called documentary history of American Puritanism. Uh, I think you need to address that as a very important point in, in, your, in your analysis. Mm -hmm. Can we take that? Well, American Puritanism, uh, you know, like so much of New England, was, was uh, special to New England uh, as opposed to America as a whole. But um, one, of, one of the points that I try to make, we Americans are a very religious people. Uh, Tocqueville found that when he came here uh, long ago, that there, that is a a very major feature of, of American life is, is the uh, belief in religion, the, the emphasis on religious values. But we're a religious people who live in a secular nation. Our constitution is secular. Our constitution is that you, 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 the Pope was just here telling people that they should let their religious faith uh, flow into their daily lives, and it should. You know, in how you interact with your fellow citizens, in how you, uh, the codes you live by. Uh, but in a secular nation, you do not let your religious views dictate the politics that you are then going to impose on all the people who don't share your religious beliefs. You know, that's, that's what's unique about the American system, is that you, you leave your religious views outside of where you cross over to dictating to people, you know, what values they're supposed to live by. But let me directly respond to your question. Uh, John McCain is pro-life, and so I think you're coming from a pro-life perspective. And so from your perspective, I, he would be considered a social conservative. Uh, in some ways, uh, John's views are perhaps uh, less important than John the person in the sense that this is a man who's running as an individual who served his country, and so he's risked his life for his country, and I think that is something for which uh, all Americans have to be deeply respectful. But that's another aspect of, of, of the life debate. Now, I think Mickey as an individual rights conservative is more in line with, uh, it's, one should respect everyone's perspective, but do you legislate it? Uh, to bind everybody else what your particular perspective is. And that is kind of the national debate. And that's where we as a society have to be very careful. You mentioned Puritanism. If you recall, <coughs> people were put in stocks and pillories if they slightly varied. <coughs> that's why many people moved to Rhode Island to get a little more religious freedom. <coughs> and so we have that kind of difference in, in the debate. Sir. <coughs> Is this on? All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming today, and uh, also thanks for uh, being from the greatest state in the union, Oklahoma. Um, Boomer Center. Yes. Um, I was struck by something uh, both you and Professor King said at the very beginning, and I guess throughout uh, the forum, which was about the imperial presidency. And you both seem to imply that President Bush has been willing to ignore the will of Congress and the legislative authority, and you said specifically on tax breaks, the war, treatment of prisoners, and wiretapping. <coughs> I don't really understand that argument, um, especially when you consider that Congress passed legislation on tax breaks, they authorized the war, uh, right. treatment of prisoners, they've all authorized that. So how, I, I don't understand how he's ignoring their will. And furthermore, if he's acting as this prime minister or the Republicans in Congress have been saying he's our team captain, we have to enact his agenda, then why didn't he get social security reform passed through? How about immigration reform or the free trade deals or get Harriet Myers confirmed? He was very much opposed on each of those issues by Congress. So, I, I just don't see support for this imperial presidency. Maybe you can make the argument on the war, but I'd like no. to. What, what I s said in the imperial presidency part was about the, the wiretaps violating you know, the, the provision in the legislation <coughs> that said you had to get a court warrant, which he did not, uh, the use of the signing statements and so <coughs> forth. I didn't, I didn't say <coughs> that about taxes or, or spending. What I said is that our founders put most of the important powers in 
the hands of the legislative branch. Uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's where I said that. I didn't use that as an example of the imperial presidency. You know, the, uh, but I also think that uh, part of the reason the president has not gotten what he wanted is because the Congress is so evenly divided so that when you have a few Republicans who break off from the great majority, you know, then, you know, he, he can't get his way. But, um, I, you know, the, the president has violated the Constitution on a number of occasions. The American Bar Association overwhelmingly declared, and, and, and the task force of the ABA uh, unanimously declared that what he was doing on signing statements was clearly unconstitutional. I mean, I don't, th I, I don't think anybody could argue that's not unconstitutional. Has the Supreme Court ruled on that? Has the Supreme Court ruled on whether the president has the ability to disobey the law? No, no they haven't had a case. No, have, has the Supreme Court ruled that he is violating the Constitution with signing statements? No, nobody's been able to bring a, oh, you mentioned the courts. Nobody mentioned, nobody has been able to bring a legal action because the courts don't grant standing. They define con the, the cases and controversies part of the Constitution is so narrowly defined that you can't get standing to bring an action. If you, if you don't like the fact that your government is conducting electronic surveillance, you can't get into court to, to protest it. But I think uh, this gentleman has <coughs> one valid point. And He's got more than one. He's more than one. From Oklahoma, he's, you know, if I go back and run, I need him. So don't, <laughs> but, I but thought he is, had a lot of valid points. But <laughs> it, it, in general, if one disagrees with the war, for instance, it is quite clear Congress voted for this war. Absolutely. And so this is a very legal war. Uh, it might be a war that's a very great mistake, but it is very legal. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, but the point Mickey's making that, that uh, is, is truly profound, uh, uh, on a signing statement to indicate not just points you differ with, which other presidents have, but because you differ that you're not going to uphold the law, has never been done before, right. and that and that is that is uh, uh, extraordinary. Yeah, let, let me also say, in terms of presidential power, uh, the most famous ruling or, or, or statement about that was by Justice Jackson of the Supreme Court, uh, who said that a president's power, when, when the president is commander in chief, that means he is in charge of troop deployment, and he is the chief strategist and tactician during wartime doesn't mean he decides when you go to war or when you get out of war, you know, uh, he, or how you treat prisoners. That, that, he doesn't have that power. He has the, he's the power of being the chief strategist. Uh, but Justice Jackson said, during wartime, the president's power is at its highest if Congress has not spoken. It is at its lowest if Congress has spoken. So when the Congress says you need a warrant before you can wiretap American citizens, the president's power is down here. The Congress has said, and it's not up to the president to decide whether he obeys it or not. Let me just, well, let me go to another question. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Akil Rangwala. I'm a freshman at Harvard College, and thank you for coming to the IP Forum. Um, my question refers to your comments earlier you made, Professor, about the current social tensions within the Republican Party. Uh, in his book, The Elephant in the Room, Ryan Sager argues uh, because of Bush's big government compassion and conservatism has led to, um, has exacerbated uh, the tension, the shaky reunion, or sorry, the shaky union within the Republican Party between the liberals and evangelicals, and believes to an extent that this has led to an almost inevitable conflict that will lead to the division of the Republican Party. My question is, do you share these same views? If not, what can be done to reconcile these current tensions within the Republican Party? And if so, can the Republican Party be a viable party within America as, a, as simply a libertarian, individual rights-based party? Uh, the second part of that, I, I really want to hear Mickey's answer to. Um, but I also want to underscore that um, a part, there is no such thing as the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. They only meet once every four years at their national conventions. There aren't even uh, parties, per se, in the states. The state parties tend to be made up of county organizations. Um, and the closer and closer you get to the grassroots, uh, the more extreme the activists tend to be. There are 3,043 counties in America, of course, 50 states and only one federal government. But all of the vitality tends to be down here at the local level. 
<clears throat> and to the extent that activists have been active at the local level, it's led, uh, it's really exacerbated this within both the Democrat and Republican parties uh, with social conservatives and, and, and social liberalism. The, the Democrats have a very uh, a f a fractious uh, debates at the local level, and I think the Republicans will be facing that soon. But it's a battle that'll be going on um, a lot over the coming years as new voters come in. And remembering that there are 511,000 elected officials in the United States, it's going to be fought seat by seat, county by county. Uh, and I don't know how it will come out. I think that from Washington, uh, the Republican Party is now so fractured that uh, they have to go back to the grassroots. And I don't know whether it will be the individual rights Republicans or the social conservative Republicans that bring the party back together. It does open up a tremendous opportunity for the Democrats. And, uh, and that's wonderful if you're a Democrat. It's dangerous for this republic if we have uh, unitary government, one party rule at every level of government or too many levels of government. I think I would just want to suggest a different paradigm. I don't think this is a battle between individual rights conservatives and non-individual rights conservatives. The U.S. Constitution is not a peer-reviewed article. You know, it, it is something that uh, spells out very clearly in most cases precisely what could be done or not. So, for example, if I say, uh, that the president, when he's presented with a piece of legislation and it is signed into law, you know, has only two choices. You know, he either vetoes it, sends it back to the people's representatives, uh, or he signs it and it becomes binding law. You know, that's not a matter of whether you're libertarian or not libertarian. It's the Constitution. The Constitution had a lot of things in it that were not perfect. Uh, and that's why the founders provided two different methods for changing it, for amending it as, uh, as we went along. But you, you have to have a common set of rules uh, when you live in a society uh, and when you're affected by government. Uh, and the common set of rules has to be our Constitution, uh, which we can amend, we can change, but until we do, that's what we live with. And the, and the Constitution spells out, the Bill of Rights you know, makes it very clear you know, that a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these liberties are underlined, and of course, uh, the anti-federalists argued that, you know, it's going to be a big mistake if you have a Bill of Rights. Somebody is going to come along in the 21st century and say, well, if you list the rights specifically in there, somebody's going to come around and say, well, then that's all the rights you have. You know, but the Constitution actually starts with the premise at its beginning, you know, that all of our rights are ours by birth. And the Constitution doesn't grant our rights. It gives a few of those, delegates a few of them to the government. So, you know, I, I don't think it's between whether you're libertarian or not. You know, I think it's whether you follow the constitutional framework or not. Sir. Yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, in uh, terms of campaign strategy, do you see any remnants of a Southern strategy kind of alive and well in the party? And for the 08 campaign season, do you think it's possible for the party and McCain to campaign as aggressively as they have before against uh, Barack or Hillary without seeming sexist or racist mm -hmm. or ageist yeah. you know um, <laughs> I by the way I have to say from my own personal perspective I sort of resent people saying that John McCain's too old um, but uh, you know I, I one, one of the terrible things I, I address this actually in the book one of the things that happened to the conservative movement over the years uh, was that different forces came into it. And I mentioned the neocons before, and I mentioned the religious right before, but the first of those groups was uh, when George Wallace, the uh, racist Democratic governor of Alabama, uh, ran for president as a Democrat, uh, lost, then ran as an independent, uh, and if you remember, he was shot and, and in Laurel, Maryland, and his campaign ended. The Republican Party in the South was virtually non-existent at that point, uh, and people who had followed George Wallace saw a party that was easy to take over, uh, and a lot of the, the Southern fundamentalists, and many of them racist, you know, came into uh, the Republican Party in the South and had a very negative effect. And uh, um, 
I, you know, I think those days are behind us. In fact, a lot of the South uh, actually became quite progressive. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I hope we don't see a point where um, Republicans revert back to uh, kind of a divide and conquer, you know, a demonizing strategy. And I hope the Democrats don't do that either. Sam, I think that the, the interesting group to watch, of course, I always think that young people are the interesting group to watch, but especially with respect to a what southern a strategy. You are. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, a politician calling me a panderer. Nikki is wonderful. <laughs> um, he's not a politician anymore. Uh, it's, it's the Hispanic vote. Uh, it's really up for grabs and uh, very interesting in the South. Uh, now, of course, the electoral rules are, were different in the Republican primaries than Democratic primaries. And in, and in Florida, although they were also punished by the National Party by only allowing half of the delegates to be seated uh, out of that process by going, by going too early, it's a winner-take-all system, winner-take-all state. John McCain and Mitt Romney had the same vote among white males but John McCain cleaned up on Hispanics. Uh, it was, it's astonishing, he did astonishingly well. Hispanics delivered the state of Florida to John McCain and provided the important boost going into Super Tuesday. Of course, Florida was on the 29th of January, Super Tuesday was on the 5th of February. This is gonna be a crucial problem for the Republican Party. Can they have a policy towards immigration that is open and will invite Hispanics in so that they have a shot in uh, the largest percentage of voters among Hispanics are in, in New Mexico, that you have a, a shot across the Southern strategy. It's going to be crucial. There's also a black-brown divide within the Democratic Party that's going to be a, a problem. And will the Republicans try and exploit that or not? But I think immigration's uh, going to be a crucial issue and we have to watch where the Hispanic vote goes. It's important to remember, too, that John McCain, 16 today, as of today, 16 days ago, went up with uh, all Spanish ads on, uh, on Spanish television. Let me just make one final comment on this subject, because you asked about a Southern strategy. I would turn it around a little bit direction-wise, uh, that in large measure, the Republican Party today is a party of the South, and the great question is whether they're going to have a Northern strategy. Uh, and that is really an issue uh, in many regards, whether you get a tipping vote in this election. Right now, it looks like John McCain is the clear favorite in the South. Uh, and therefore, the battleground is going to, frankly, be uh, three, four, five major northern states. And we're going to have to wait and see. Let me turn to uh, Congressman Greg Gansky. And Greg is one of the really distinguished people that. Uh, I serve with, and we're honored you're with us. Greg is here not because he's from here, because he's visiting his Harvard <laughs> Medical School daughter who just ran in the marathon. And so we're honored that you're with us, Greg. Thank you, Jim. Um, Congressman Edwards, I sh really share your concerns about these sh uh, signing statements. And it's been something that's really bothered me, and I suspect that without putting words in her mouth that has bothered former Congressman Morella, who's sitting here too. Um, in your conversation with Speaker Pelosi, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not think that there has been a sense of Congress on this issue, a, d a full debate on the floor, on, on signing statements and sort of the feeling that, and I don't know if Bush has expressly said it in these words, but, you know, I'll follow these laws if I want to, but if I don't want to, I won't. And I, sh I share with Professor King's concerns that the longer this goes on, you know, we could very well could see this with a Democratic president next with a Democratic Congress. And as a former member of Congress, I think that Congress has certain constitutionally enumerated duties, and it really, really bothers me what I've seen on these signing statements. So my question to you is, in your conversation with Speaker Pelosi, did you ever suggest to her that maybe she ought to have a full debate on the floor and a sense of Congress that this is totally unconstitutional, what the president is doing on this? Well, I hate to say this because then she'll probably cancel it, but the meeting hasn't happened yet. It happens on May 1st, and uh, uh, I was going to suggest that to her. I think, I think that's 
a very important point, a very important, I think, uh, you know, on, on a different issue, but to make the same point. Um, when I was in the House, when Jim was in the House, uh, Republicans had discovered a cure for cancer and for everything else. It was going to solve all the problems in the world, two of them. One was term limits and one was line item veto, which I, I said they were the two of the dumbest ideas I, I'd ever heard. And they were both unconstitutional. On their face, they're unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court, dominated by conservatives, has ruled you know, that, that they were both unconstitutional. But one of the arguments that, that came up at that time was I said, OK, forget the constitutional question. Forget the fact that, you know, that it's a dumb idea. If you give Ronald Reagan, or then later George H.W. Bush, this power, I know you don't want to think about this, there could someday be a Democrat in the White House. You know, and that Democrat will have the same power that you have just given, you are, and, and you can't take it away. You've set a, once you set a precedent about giving power from the executive, I mean from the legislative branch over to the executive, it is going to be almost impossible to ever get it back. And that unravels our whole separation of powers system. Uh, and so, I mean, I completely agree with you. I think it's an excellent idea. Uh, and I, I will pursue it. I mean, I thought of it, but I, uh, I don't know if I would have brought it up. But now I definitely will. So I can tell you that I did. <laughs> Young lady. Sir, thank you for being here. My name is Valerie Boyd. I'm an MPP2. And um, my question is also about your description of the imperial presidency. Um, it, it seems that um, the president could only control the policy direction of Congress if, um, it, sort of with the sort of approval and understanding of the Congress, and also in the absence of a really forceful policy agenda uh, being pushed uh, by by party leaders. So, I guess uh, m my question is: Is have there been failures of leadership in Congress itself? I think. I, I apologize for conveying this in, in present company, but some of my young friends in Washington have said, you know, what does Congress do except write letters and point fingers? And um, I, I, I'm just wondering what you think Congress could be doing better. I, I just think that, that was brilliant. Uh, one of the things I have in my book, I have this line that if the President of the United States has been guilty of malfeasance, now, you may or may not think that, I do, but, it, but if you think the president has been guilt, guilty of malfeasance, the Congress has been guilty of nonfeasance, of not doing its duty, of not acting as a separate branch of government. People, you know, I've suggested that if, uh, if people on the, in Congress, and I've told some of my friends in Congress this, you know, if they really want to help carry out the president's agenda, they should apply for a job on his staff. Uh, instead of taking up space in the Congress. Let, let, let me tell a quick little story, and, and uh, uh, Jim has heard this. A little story, I, I now teach at Princeton, I apologize for that, but uh, I, I discussed this with my students. There was an article in uh, the Washington Post by a columnist named Dana Milbank, and it was a question, you know, it raised this question about the various ways presidents of the United States do different things. So Milbank was describing a, a visit that the president of the United States was getting ready to take, uh, this current president, and he said, for the next week or week and a half, I don't remember what it was, the president is going to step out of his role as head of government to now function in his other role as head of state, which <laughs> raises, of course, questions about treaties and all this stuff, right? So, you know, here you're head of government, now you're going to act in this other role as head of state. And I said to my students, so, so what does that tell you? Tell me, you know, tell me what you get out of that. The answer is the president's not the head of government. David made a point before about, you know, getting more and more like a parliamentary system. In our system of government, the president is not the head of government. He's the head of one of three branches of government, which are separate, independent, and completely equal. And in fact, to go to the point I was trying to make before about the war power, the spending power, the taxing power, uh, that most of the important powers in our system of government are in the people's hands through their representatives, not in the executive branch. I, you, I thought that, you made a great point. Yeah, and I, there are two things that you need to read and, and read soon. I see a bunch of wonderful Congress, former Congress students out here, and Stu and Barbara and Sunil and Yasmina and Donald, uh, and I wish you were in my class as well. You have to read Mickey's book. It's, it's really wonderful. And you have to read Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution. And all of your friends in Washington have to read Article One, Section 8. And all of our children have to read Article One, Section 8 because we've forgotten the true meaning of it. And uh, it's not by some happenstance 
that the founders immediately after the preamble, the first words in the Constitution are, all lawmaking powers shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. They didn't give lawmaking powers anywhere else. It belongs in the people's house. We've forgotten that. Members of Congress themselves, foolishly, thinking of party first, have forgotten that. And it, we have to change it. Up high. Hi, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I thank you for bringing up the issue of the line item veto. I agree with you entirely, and it's been my argument against it as well. My question is, um, I see that our founding fathers attempted to set up a system where we send wise, <coughs> trained people to form our government who will, as you said, make the laws. They are the legislator, the legislature, and they are to make the laws for our country. How can we get our legislature back to doing that job instead of fighting one party against the other? How many of you uh, have gone to a town meeting when your congressman, when, when Greg or Connie or Jim showed up? Uh, how many of you go to a town meeting when your congressman's in town? Well, part of the answer is all those of you who don't. Um, you know, when, when somebody is running for Congress, because your points were absolutely right, when somebody is running for Congress, you need to show up. Or, or even while they're serving and they have come back and have town or neighborhood meetings and challenge them and, and about where their loyalty is, whether it's to their party, whether it's to uh, the, the president, or whether it's to the Constitution and the people they represent. Uh, and most members of Congress don't ever get challenged with that question. And if you look at the, the presidential race right now, uh, you, you have, I, I will say, I think there are three qualified, good people running for president. You know, you may, we may have our preferences as to which one we want. Uh, but you have three people who are, who are pretty decent people running for president. And they get up there, and one of them is going to win, and the other two are not. Uh, and, and you have debates, and you get people like Wolf Blitzer or uh, George Stephanopoulos, or, you know, people asking questions that, that have nothing to do, you know, with their understanding of the role of the president you know, how far they believe they're entitled to go in uh, uh, making war decisions or whatever. You know, uh, the people need to speak up. You know, we can't count on the media. The media doesn't understand any of this. Uh, so uh, you, you can get it back. You can take the country back if, if, if you step out and you do it. You coming apart, Jim? <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm actually uh, interested in the uh, Oklahoma City bombing. I've got a uh, piece of paper here that says that uh, a classified Pentagon study confirms that the Oklahoma City bombing was caused by more than one bomb. Uh, the classified report uh, uh, had two independent Pentagon experts concluded that the destruction of the federal building in Oklahoma City in April 1995 was caused by five separate bombs. How could that be possible? Uh, I feel as though you're the perfect person to ask, uh, being from Oklahoma. Well, I mean, I, I've never heard that, and I, and I don't know it. I don't know uh, enough about the explosives that were there. Uh, I have actually listened to uh, tape recordings of the actual explosions, uh, and I've been at the site on more than one occasion. Uh, I've never heard that. I mean, they would have all had to go off, you know, very, you know, simultaneously. Um, you know, which I suppose is possible, but I've never heard anything like that. There are actually, uh, oh, they cut my mic. Um, there are actually numerous uh, news reports where they're reporting secondary, uh, secondary bombs that hadn't been exploded. Um, yeah, I do. And, and the, uh, the, the um, evidence has since been buried. Um, do, the, uh, do the people in Oklahoma feel satisfied with the uh, results of uh, whatever investigation there was? Well, so, some people in Oklahoma feel the investigation was uh, inadequate. Some people feel it was, it was perfectly adequate and, and that, you know, the, they got the people who did it. Um, 
Um, you know, I mean, you're, you're way beyond any expertise I have in that regard. Sir. Douglas Bond. <clears throat> I'm uh, concerned about the Republican Party in that it seems to be so distant from the party that most of our parents and grandparents knew, and uh, in that it, in my estimation, has abandoned its principles in order to establish a coalition of somewhat naive um, idealists of various ilks. Uh, I'm wondering if it is to reconstitute itself, especially in terms of a uh, traditional conservative uh, vein, how people are going to be educated, how there's going to be enough people um, who actually know what it is or what, it, what, it, what, it, what its principles are, how that's going to be assembled in order to um, bring together such a party. Um, well, let me take one crack. At this. Part of Mickey's book is about the political movement getting lost, and then he's going to tell us how it can find its way back. And I think that is the question, Mickey. Uh, well, I, you know, there's a couple of things in there uh, about that, but let, let me answer this first. Just as I pointed the finger back at all the people who don't go to the town meetings or, you know, people, the media, you know, the, the education system, uh, it's not only... When, when I tell people that the president's not the head of government, it's... Really? Uh, you know... It, it, I love this school. I taught here 11 years. I love this place. Thank God for David King, and I mean that really sincerely because I've taught now at Princeton. I've taught at Georgetown. Most major universities, including most Ivy League universities, teach primarily courses about the executive branch, and they call the executive branch the government. The executive branch isn't the government. This is not Britain. You know, it's part of it. You know, our, our universities don't teach, uh, even the law schools, uh, the law schools have very few courses on the Constitution. So the Constitution uh, and, and uh, the legislative branch, which is the single most powerful branch in American government, don't get taught, even at the best universities. So, I mean, it's a long haul. I mean, it really, I, I'd like to have a very quick answer, but, but it's a long haul. Uh, we've, we have so, we have gone so far down the road of people not remembering what kind of a system the founders created that, that you have to address it in the schools, you have to address it in the media, you, you have to address it confronting people at town meetings and all. Very quickly, just a couple of quick points in there. Um, so I've, I've already started on, the, on being controversial, Let me, I'll just keep doing it. Uh, you remember Robert Bork when I, I said, you know, remember what our, what our beliefs are. Robert Bork was nominated for uh, uh, the Supreme Court, and I opposed him. And, you know, let me give you an example of one reason. He was opposed to the decision in Roe v. Wade, which you can be for it or against it. But his reasoning was that uh, Roe v. Wade was badly decided because the courts found a right of privacy that doesn't exist in the Constitution. And, and so that's when I, I had... Uh, my breakfast with him, and I said, did you really say that? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then you don't understand the Constitution because it did not create our rights. So, but, you know, th there are so many misunderstandings. The war right now. What was the conservative position on the military? Now, some of the people who were, you know, not as conservative as some of us would get very upset because we wanted to spend so much money on the military because they, they want to spend it on other things that they thought had more value. But the conservative belief was in peace through strength. You spent money on national defense because you thought that was the way to keep the peace, not to find ways to go to war. Uh, and, you know, so going to war should have been our very last thing. So I say we should uh, recapture that. And, and then I say uh, that what we need to do is to reject the legacy of Newt Gingrich, who turned everything while I was there into if you're a Republican, your job is to contribute money to a common pot to defeat Democrats. Your job, or else you don't get a ranking position on a committee or a chairmanship or, or a spot in the leadership. And we're going to take wedge issues to the floor to, you know, uh, force Democrats to cast votes that'll get them in trouble. You know, it's, it's a lot. I've got it all in there, and I'm not going to go through them. But, you know, there are some things we have to unlearn in, uh, in order to, to progress. We're going to have one last question from this gentleman in the red. Hi, my name is Don Kurth. I'm uh, a mid-career MPA student here at uh, the Kennedy School. 
In the past, the Republican Party, the conservatives, were looked at as the defenders of civil rights and defenders of human rights, and somehow that seems to have gotten lost, and, and, or, or at least in the eyes of the public, the Democrats have stolen that from us. H how did that happen, and how can we get it back? Well, I don't mind if they steal it. I mean, I would be glad if, if everybody of all parties were, were supporting uh, uh, civil rights. Um, you know, it, well, it was all these things we've talked about. I mean, it, it's uh, putting party first. Uh, it's hmm. Part of it is that we as a nation, for all of the wonderful things, all of the wonderful things about this nation, we do tend sometimes to panic. Uh, when John Adams was president, uh, some of you have been watching this, but we've been talking about it a long time. And when John Adams was president, uh, we had the Alien and Sedition Acts. Somebody criticizes the government, you throw them in jail. Uh, World War II, you know, somebody comes from Japanese parents or grandparents or great grandparents, you throw them in a concentration camp. Uh, and and we, have, we have repeatedly overact, overreacted. But the founders were pretty smart. Al-Qaeda is a threat, there is no question. Al-Qaeda could cause a lot of loss of life. Al-Qaeda cannot destroy us as a nation, they can't do that. Al-Qaeda is not as big a threat either to the national identity and integrity or the lives of individuals as the Soviet Union was with its nuclear missiles, its standing armies, and the armies of all of Eastern Europe. And at the time, in 1787 when the Constitution was written, the founders knew that if either Britain or France had concentrated their resolve on doing so, they could have wiped us out as a nation. And at that moment, even with George Washington becoming president, they still said, we're not gonna put these powers in the hands of a president. So we, we have to go back and, and learn these basic lessons again, because we, we do tend to, uh, to panic. We do tend to say, oh my God, you know, somebody wants to hurt us, let's give all the power. You know what, just think about this rationally for a moment. If the threat is so great that a miscalculation could be disastrous, isn't that more reason not to have one person making all the decisions? I think it is. So, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of learning to do, and I'm hopeful that we can do it. Well, I want to thank uh, Mickey and, and David. And one of the reasons we started with philosophy, partly that's Mickey's book, but partly uh, American politics has drifted from being philosophically driven to being constituency group driven. And that causes all sorts of different ways of thinking how you expand parties instead of advancing the national good. Uh, in any regard, uh, this evening, uh, uh, Mickey's going to be a, 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 a signature uh, machine as thousands of people line up at the co op to buy his book. And I. Uh, Hope you all come and get there early. Uh, in any regard, I want to thank David King, Mickey Edwards, uh, Mickey Fine Book, David Fine Discussion. Uh, we thank you all for coming. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.